So beginning with uh, uh, just a couple of points of background to family group decision making um, for children at risk. So children at risk, um, for this review, we were defining that as, on a, <clears throat> you'd hope you don't mind me referring to a few notes here because we get so nervous or forget where I am. But anyway, children at risk, children and young people, for this particular review, we took it as people aged between not to 18 years who have been the subject of a child maltreatment investigation. So this is very much about statutory social work, you know, government, state-sponsored social work, where there is an obligation on the state to intervene. And it's a review questioning how effective family group decision-making is as opposed to more traditional methods. Um, which brings me to the next key item that we need to get to the bottom of, what is family group decision-making? And uh, there's a number of different models. The one that we're gonna be most familiar with is family group conferencing, which is a term that's used, uh, was first used when it, when it came out of New Zealand. Um, and I think that was early 80s. Um, so it's key, key, key uh, features of a family group decision-making model for making decisions about what happens to children um, and where they go from here during a child protection investigation. So the key parameters of, of this model would be that there's been a concerted effort to convene the family including extended family, including friends and community members. So that's maybe a wee bit off the side of what a lot of uh, child protection teams are doing. Um, and then secondly, it would be uh, child protection professionals as well as other service providers um, who are working around the child are all participating in this meeting. Um, the idea would be that people are working collaboratively to form a plan and it's a plan that is very much family centered and the decision making is led by the family. Um, and a key feature would be that an independent meeting facilitator that is not a child protection officer um, is running the meeting. And the, the, the family get private time during the process to discuss what's going on at the meeting. So there's a number of features there that may not usually may not well often won't happen in a in a normal child protection investigation. Um, so that's family group decision making. That's child protection, child uh, children at risk. So those are the two key concepts that I wanted to describe to begin with. Um, okay. So a little bit then about the the review team. Um, two of our, our review team were from, uh, well, Zimbabwe and South Africa. That's uh, Admire Shirini and uh, Mfatso Kamendia. And sorry, that, that pronunciation is terrible, but just forgive me on that. And then the rest of us were um, based in Northern Ireland, myself and my two colleagues, uh, Jason and uh, Paul, based at a neighboring university. And then there's Aaron Shlonsky, who's sort of the father of this. He uh, he started this process way back in 2009. In fact, the protocol for this review was published way back in 2009. And we didn't actually get the review done until, until this year. So you can see it's, it's not an easy thing. It wasn't an easy thing to get organized and get finished, but uh, it was very much an international team. And then also these stars here are about where the actual studies came from. And you can see that the the bulk of them were in the US. We had two from Canada, one from Sweden, and one from Holland. Sorry, the Netherlands. Uh, so that just gives you a feel for, for where these studies are coming from. And it's not a great picture, really, when you see it. I would argue that our review team is nicely spread out, but uh, the, the actual the studies that we were able to find um, are very much US-focused. And I think that's a reflection of a lot of the research in social work. Um, when it comes to quantitative research, we are often falling back on what is happening in the US. Um, it, it, it seems to be a lot more determined, determination there about quantitative evaluation of, of social work practice. 
Tony, so that, does that, I'm sorry, does that reflect where family group decision making is actually being done or, um, no, or is it more broadly just where the research is, is happening actually? Yeah, no, I would argue that it doesn't. The, the, um, the family group decision making, for example, there's nothing there from New Zealand or Australia. There's no, there's no studies there from New Zealand or Australia which, in which family group decision making is done quite a bit. In New Zealand in particular, they don't have any quantitative uh, evaluations which met the criteria of rigor for this review. And I'm not sure they have any quantitative evaluations besides that. So, you know, that's a surprise. Um, Ireland and the UK, there's quite a lot of family group decision, family group conferencing going on. Uh, well, maybe that's an exaggeration. It's maybe not quite a lot, but there certainly is some. And again, no quantitative evaluations. Uh, so, so that's interesting in itself. Um, so why should it work? It, it, I mean, intuitively it should work. Uh, harnesses family strengths, counters isolation of the family, it makes them the center of, center of it, center of the decision-making processes, uh, control, buy-in, it draws in community resources, which as we all know are, are key. And it reduces that power imbalance that, that we're always fighting against in, in social work training and practice. So there's good reasons why it should work. Um, what did we find? So key, the, the key finding therefore was no evidence that it, that it actually, if I had to summarize it all down, that's what I would have to say. Um, you know, there was a finding, a statistical finding from quasi-experimental studies that it reduces child mal maltreatment marginally. Um, but I, I couldn't really, if it was forced into a headline, I, I couldn't say that. There were, that was quasi-experimental studies, not the RCTs. And uh, it was a marginal, uh, a marginal uh, effect size, um, very heterogeneous results across the, the, the study body, if you, if you know what I mean. So you couldn't really hang your hat on that and say there's evidence to support that it works. But just as importantly, there's no evidence to suggest here that it's doing harm in, in broad terms. Um, and that's, for me, just as important because that, that, that's a key reason why I'm interested in, in, in evaluating social work research, social work practice, because there, there are possibilities to, to do things badly. Um, just as important as a headline finding is the context around that. Um, so I've got a number of pieces of context. Let's start with this. Um, I would point out that large effect sizes for any intervention targeting this problem, targeting child mal maltreatment are gonna be very hard to come by. Um, when you think of the reasons for child maltreatment, they're often you know, within and without, outside the family. Um, I would imagine uh, I don't have to go into the detail of that, but there's you know there's intractable mental health problems involved at times. Um, there's all sorts of stresses put upon families that are not going to be solved very easily by any intervention. So looking for an effect size is difficult in that environment. Uh, over the years, when you consider that family group conferencing was was first become uh, popular and first was legislated for in New Zealand, I think in 88, 1988, and it's been written about so much since that. Um, it's been absorbed into normal child protection practice to some degree, you would have to argue. Um, when I think of our own case conference system that we have here in Northern Ireland, you know, it's missing a few items from family group conferencing, but it does still endeavor to put the child and the family right in the middle of the of the of the of the decision making meetings so to a degree it has been a bit like cbt um struggles to get the effect sizes it used to um is that because cbt is being absorbed into a lot of narrative um that is that people are exposed to nowadays anyway um so that'll be another aspect of the context um I can't actually see that top one. <laughs> a ribbon has just dropped. It's gone again. Okay. 
uh, good time to the prioritization of family plans. So that's the same point again that uh, family group conferencing has been that that sort of ideal has been absorbed. Therefore, the comparison that we're comparing it to isn't as isn't isn't as big a contrast as as you would have in other types of research. Um, here's an interesting point and part of the context: families have a right to self determination. Family group decision making promotes that right. How do RCTs fit in this picture? I mean, are you going to start doing RCTs with various other aspects of, of human rights? You know, if, if it is something that families have to have uh, as a human right, that they have to be put at the center of a decision making process, um, then where does RTC, RCTs fit into that? So I'm just I'm, I'm putting that out there because I know that's what some critiques of this type of uh, research um, are, are centered around. Um, there's, a, there's a counter argument to that, that, that family group decision making is a definable intervention and therefore should be uh, evaluated. Um, so that's a discussion we can get into as we move forward. Um, FGDM is only as good as support provided to families. So here's the point that, you know, did, I, did we not find great effect sizes here because it was never been implemented properly and families aren't being given that support. So families might decide on a plan that works for them, but then who helps them implement that plan? Was any funding made available to make sure that those things happen uh, that the family agreed upon? So it's only as good as the support that the family is given. Uh, and is that not something we should be measuring as hard as we're measuring and, and the efficacy of it? Um, Families prefer FGDM, so there's a number of there, there's a number of findings out there, and uh, quite a lot of qualitative findings that uh, families prefer FGDM to normal social work child protection practice. So in that context, you know, um, does a, a finding of no effect and no harm, um, you know. Is that as important as the fact that families actually prefer it? Um, but the other part of the context was that until this review and a couple of other recent reviews, I'm thinking of uh, in particular Distra's review from uh, who are uh, Distra and colleagues who are based in, I think it's Sweden, Netherlands, Norway, um, Northern European anyway. Um, so this review and that review, we both found, you know, that, that there's no clear evidence for FGDM. That's a long way from what the last big review pointed out, and that was the American Humane Society in 2003. And this, this idea here, which I'll let you read that yourself, this idea has been kicking around for the guts of 20 years, um, that family group decision making really works. But it was based on, like, I think it was 26 studies and they were all qualitative. Um, um, some of them were commentaries. Um, one of them had some quantitative data in it and we included it in this review. But, you know, I think that was, you know, looking back on, the, on that idea that came from, from Merkel at all, that that was, you know, looking in hindsight, we could now, I would argue now that was a bit misleading. Uh, so that's another part of the context. So we're left, I hope, well, how am I doing for time? It's, it's one o'clock. So probably should hurry up a bit and get to the end of this to give us some more time for, for discussion. But uh, so it's a flagship. I mean, if ever there was an intervention which was a flagship for social work, it has to be family group conferencing. I mean, it's about bringing families together. It's about working on relationships, building relationships and finding resources that are inherent in a family and helping them to find the solutions themselves and also embracing the community around them. So it's, it's, it's everything social work is supposed to be. And yet we weren't able to find that it works very clearly when we evaluated it uh, in, the, in a, a rigorous quantitative way. Uh, it's been around for four decades. Um, but we've only had a very small, there was what, 15 studies in this review? And some of them were, you know, very just scraping in in terms of quality. Um, so it's a 
body of evidence which is notable for being small, it's notable for the, the lack of rigor. Even the studies which we did find, that, and when you look at the bias and the potential bias in this body of evidence we presented here, the, the potential for bias within it is, is very, very high compared to other reviews. Um, so it's notable for its potential for bias. The existing studies that social work is producing really, in summary of what I'm trying to say here is, uh, it's not rigorous. So, so we can't really argue that we're doing rigorous research on social work practice at the moment, as far as I can see based on this. Um, and just a little bit more about this, I just pull a wee bit more background about this. So here was an idea that you can't really do experimental evaluation with social work practice. Um, and I've, I've had lots of discussions like this. I mean, this uh, web here is arguing that you want to put people under control. So there's this idea that we sh shouldn't be using control groups. I've had people saying things to me like, uh, what, you want to randomize these people? This is already a vulnerable population and you want to start randomizing them and make them more obscure. And so I get arguments like that, a lot of discussions like that um, with people. And I'm just interested to hear any ideas on that. Uh, and then on the, on the other side, then um, I would like to point out a, a, a really rigorous trial of trauma-focused CBT that was done with maltreated children. Uh, completed by Berliner, and uh, the, the references for these are at the very end. I'll just let you absorb that yourself rather than me reading it out. Okay, so that's just a counter argument around the, the, the fact that we can do this kind of, kind of research uh, on social work practice. Um, so, I was actually in another meeting this morning about research and uh, a couple of these arguments were given me to this, mor this morning about why we, we can't do, maybe maybe we can't do a, a, a trial of a perpetrator program, a, a, de a domestic violence perpetrator program, but uh, these sort of arguments that uh, there's all these people sitting out say, you know, what do you do whenever everybody's so different and all this sort of thing. Um, and then it just makes me think of that intersection between social work, evidence-based practice, experimental evaluation. We've been talking about evidence-based practice and social work for so many years. And, you know, how, how far have we come? Um, or when you look at what's been produced um, most recently, um, in terms of study reports, um, how many of them are, are, are reporting rigorous evaluations of practice? Um, very, very few. Uh, so I'm very interested in any other thoughts on that. Um, and that's it, actually. So I can stop sharing. Those are, that's those references. I can stop sharing. And hopefully there's some comments and questions.